Good evening, everybody. This evening it's a fantastic occasion with my one of my favorite artists ever, Lee Ritnor. You will see magical things tonight. They have been working hard for their sound quality. It's like being in front of a, your hi-fi with the <laughs> with the album. Uh, instead, tonight you will see Lee face to face, at least in front of your computer, you know. So, good evening, everyone. First of all, if you are not aware about Music Off, this is the most important Italian community for musicians. So, I'm an, a poor Italian guy, so I really apologize at the beginning of this live streaming for my bad English. So, I guess I hope this will be understandable for you all, guys. And good evening, everyone. I suggest you, if you are on Facebook, just to go through um, and check the live stream on YouTube or Twitch and Music Off um, channels so you can get the proper listening quality from this outstanding uh, live show tonight. Good evening, everyone. Let me see some of the comments. Yeah, good evening. <laughs> yeah, the magician of the six, six strings. If you, if you feel you want to, to send some <clears throat> questions to Lee, feel free to send a message to our Twitch channel. Now I will send the countdown, so in two minutes we can get this straight. You know, we just need always this a couple of minutes to be sure everything is going uh, correctly and uh, we have the video going everywhere, etc. Uh, just me prepare this interface. Okay, let me check. Yeah, yeah, my team, Music of Team is uh, everyone. They, they, they are just uh, looking at the live show now and they are sending me messages <laughs> to say, okay, it's everything all right. The sound is, it's okay. So, good evening, Michael Cole. Good evening, Francesco Savrese. Yeah, <laughs> it's a nice hive. Good evening, Samuele Pertuca. Base community, good evening. Marco Git, good evening. Master Malta State of Mind, good evening, guys. Good evening, welcome. This is um, very shaken because it's a very special occasion. Uh, I cannot cannot tell how, how long I waited for this moment and I how much I desired to be tonight here with Lee and with you all just to introduce you one of the most outstanding <laughs> composer and guitar players of the nearly 50 years old. <coughs> it's the apotheosis in it. Hello Federico Roncoletta, good evening. Good evening Elementi Sonori, nice to meet you again guys. Noisy Motion, good evening, Vicious Vicious, good evening. There are too many guys. <laughs> and yeah, we want real funk. <laughs> good evening Osvaldo Iacono. Hello Tommy Greco, what's up? So if you have time guys, place a like on your on this um, video on YouTube and share it so we get more people looking at this special occasion and uh, you will not regret it. Hello DNA, no there are no captions, we will do <coughs> straight with uh, English. Let's see if we can sort it out for a new occasion. Let's give it a shot. Okay guys, good evening. I'm so proud to, to have Lee tonight. He has been very, very kind to join us. And I guess this is maybe if not the first, one of the first live streaming he's doing so far. So uh, it's a very special, special gift. I'm feeling so blessed of this presence tonight because he has a lot to share. It's not just the music, but all his experience, the feelings and all the, I, I think also the, the um, journeys he have done in, uh, in his uh, incredible lifetime. So I guess we are quite a many, <laughs> 500 people online already. So I guess I need to introduce you this the legend, Mr. Lee Rittner. Hey. Good evening, Lee. Hello, nice to Thomas. see you. Hello, Hello everyone. <laughs> so what's so. up? Well, you know, I'm here in Los Angeles. It's noon here, and uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, I've had a chance to do a lot of things in life, and this is not the first live stream that I've ever done, of course, but 
Uh, it's not something where I normally... Uh, uh, you do every day. I do every day, and it's not where I live. You know, it's like this is really kind of the new normal for most people and around the world, and uh, certainly uh, musicians sharing and everybody. Uh, but it's interesting because you know we make records and and we play shows and we get together with other musicians and rehearse and and we. And, and of course we're online and, and we're, everybody's online these days for years but um, you know actually setting up a good sound and, and having it come through to the, the rest of the world via this way yeah this is hip <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the world is changing very fast especially this year with the pandemic situation we experienced to be less in contact i mean face to face and yeah. you can cannot even touch people with the streaming but at least it's something uh, i cannot imagine something like this 10 years ago without the ah. internet connections and video exactly you know so it, 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 i'm glad to be a part of it you know so And I'm, I'm Very nice. With, and I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles. I, I guess you guys are nine hours ahead, right? And, yeah, uh, it's 9 p.m. And, and uh, you know, my, my record label in the, the Netherlands is, is Mascot, and uh, they're, they're in Rotterdam or parts of Netherlands, and then in London and New York, and, and, uh, and then I'm dealing with Yamaha uh, Records and, and in Japan. in Japan, and, and they're a day and a half ahead, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's everybody's all over the place. <laughs> yeah, indeed. They are very far from you. I mean, uh, time looking at the timetable, it's a one yeah. day and a half. But, you know, we're all also... I come from the era where I've, I've seen just about uh, every aspect of the, of the music business up till to, and currently today. And uh, I used to dream of the days that my albums, because uh, I think I was 20 three or four years old when I did my first album and and so I've, I've gone through every variation of of making records and uh, from 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 the beginnings of you know two inch tape and and LPs and, uh, and 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 hoping that the records would get released in certain countries and now at a push of a button uh, everybody's together you know, and, you're, so. and you're ready to be listened everywhere yeah it's cool Yeah, I'm know, looking at it even now. There are people online now looking at this live stream from any country in the world, I guess, from different locations and with different styles and cultures. Uh, so I'm It, very, uh, very uh, feeling really blessed for this situation to have you here and give a chance to all these people to keep in touch with you, with your uh, fantastic music. So thanks a lot, Lee. It's a, it's a nice... Christmas gifts gift for me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the guitar uh, is at the center of a lot of this, right? For for at least for me, for you guys too, yeah. you know. So, uh, it's it's been on the the journey since I was eight years old. So I'm 68 now. So, it's 60 years of doing this. <laughs> it's so many. So Lee, d before I give you the first question do you fancy to play something just to introduce the the appointment well, this uh, this is the Yamaha guitar obviously
it's something yeah simple, you know nice introduction thank you i'm very curious that people are on sending messages in chat saying where they are um, if you fancy guys just type in chat where are you where you, do you come from so i will tell you to leave some very strange country you're looking this streaming at the moment well thanks a lot it was magic really just the sound is it's amazing it seems to be to be there and i want to thank also your sound engineers i mean daniele di giovanni and gary lee yeah. they have done an outstanding work to to have this at this level at least for for the live stream absolutely yeah okay you ready mm -hmm. please okay so one of your of your first jobs when you were very young was with the mamas and papas what do you remember of that musical period so crucial i would say for the united states and the west coast sound well it, it was uh you know growing up in los angeles and I've, i've been here my whole life and i thank my parents for moving out here from the the midwest of the of the u.s which was terrific but cold and and the the, the music world and and the films and television and recording studios they were all happening uh primarily in los angeles and san francisco and new york of course and and uh, nashville there was great music all around the u.s but th those were kind of the centers and there was a lot of film work in um in la and of course la always had the the sunshine so uh, the generally the sunnier weather if you like that and we did So I grew up here, and there was great guitar players here. And uh, uh, when my dad, uh, he, he was an amateur piano player, and his mom played some piano, and, and so there was music in the house, and they, they, he loved uh, jazz and big bands and you know Sinatra and, and all the singers and the big bands at that time, and Stan Getz and... and Showbeam was coming with the Brazilian music, and so it was just a great period of, of music. And and then, of course, you know the world was experiencing the rock and roll, and the Beatles were coming, and then later the Stones, and and uh, so it was. And and at the same time, there was just guitar all over the place. Guitar was just whether it was on television with the cowboy shows, you know, and and and, and or on rock and roll shows, and and. Buddy Holly and uh, you know all the early rock was coming and Elvis and and then the Beatles but then the guitar was really seriously coming and and when you think about that period there was a legend uh, playing on the guitar in, er in every field so for instance in blues BB King Albert King John Lee Hooker they were all you know BB was completely in his prime you know and Albert King and uh, all, all the blues guys. Then you had all these incredible jazz guys, and a lot of them lived in L.A. You know, you had Joe Pass, you had Barney Kessel, you had Howard Roberts, and then you had people passing through town like Wes Montgomery and Kenny Burrell and uh, Jim Hall and just, uh, you know, legends all musician. on jazz guitar. And then, you, and then, of course, on the rock side, you had, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden there was going to be this guy, Jimi Hendrix, exploding. And then you had Clapton, and you had Beck, and, and then you had all these groups on the West Coast, you know, the Love and Spoonful and the Mamas and the Papas, and, and, and doing these great harmonies, and then the folk guitar. And then somebody like Dylan comes along, and he's just strumming simple guitar, and, but writing these unbelievable tunes and, and singing. So, you know, it was just all this stuff. So I was, to answer this question now, so I just had to set that up that... The guitar and music was everywhere. So by the time I was 12, I knew I wanted to play the guitar. I, I, I wanted to like, I had started at eight years old, but I told my dad I want to be a guitar player. So he he oh, even nice. called, he he even helped, like he, everybody's name was in the phone book in those days. So he, he called up Joe Pass out of the phone book and said, I have this talented kid, would you give him a lesson? So he, I think Joe Pass gave me a couple lessons at uh, when I was, you know, 13. And... And same with Barney Kessel. And then Barney recommended uh, this great teacher, Duke Miller, that became really the center of my musical education. And he went on later to uh, uh, put together the studio guitar department at the University of Southern California, USC. So there was, you know, there was just serious teachers and, 
and 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 good environment to learn. So I was in a band. Uh, somebody at a music store had recommended to me, and uh, somebody wanted to start a, a band that, and she, he had a an actress singer who was kind of a Janis Joplin type, and 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 this guy was a vibe player, and he had had a Latin jazz group at the time, and he wanted to combine Latin jazz and rock, and this was in the 60s you know so he, he was actually ahead of his time the the group and and never really ended up going anywhere but uh, at one point he had met uh, John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas and and uh, he he got John to demo our first record so um, do a demo for us and and so we went up to uh, John Phillips's studio which was in this mansion on Sunset Boulevard one of those mansions that you drive by and you go who the hell lives at these places you know and and uh sure enough john phyllis from the moments and pops had there and he had a studio on the second floor of his house um uh, you know the bedroom's down the hall and in the other room is his studio and you open it up it's this full-on professional studio and at 16 i walked into that going this is what i want you know so that was you know in the the, the late 60s and uh, so we we did the demo it didn't go anywhere the band didn't go anywhere the song didn't go anywhere but on that demo was uh bassist leland scalar and he oh, was yeah, he, he was 19 he went on to have this phenomenal career as a studio musician and uh in phil collins band and, and james taylor's band and and just uh still you know probably one of the busiest bass players in the world and then the drummer was a young drummer ed green and uh not as well known as a name but he went on to record as a famous studio musician and uh was on all the barry white motown uh sessions and so he was the drummer on that date and uh and 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 then john phillips asked me to stay the next day and come back and record something for the mamas and the papas and and so that was different than our demo that we were doing for our band and um, for years, I looked if it, anything had ever come out on that, whatever song it was at that time. And uh, I never found it. Later, I found out that John almost recorded every day. That apparently yeah. there's vaults and vaults and vaults of tracks. And, and this, so his, he was one of those early proponents of, of what now we all, t- we all take for granted with a, a computer interface and music software and we're all making music constantly, you know, I mean, you can ship, you can do a demo on your phone, you know, <laughs> but um, <laughs> back in alone. those days, yeah, but in those days, he had a complete setup, a uh, beautiful full-on studio, and he was recording constantly, and so I don't think there was too many people doing that at that point, you know, but he he was at the forefront of that. Yeah, that that was a very big start. I mean, <laughs> going on the phone book and get a, the phone number of Joe Pass and say, "Hello, Joe, can I have some lessons from you?" <laughs> well, that was my father doing that. I I couldn't do that at 13, but he, you know, he he did. He wasn't shy, and he did the same thing with uh, uh, with Barney Kesso. And, and later, I studied classical guitar with uh, Christopher Parkening. And who, who was sort of the heir apparent at the time as a young man to Segovia. And so mm. he, 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 was, he, he went on also to teach at USC and at Pepperdine and, uh, just, uh, and, had, and he had his recording career on Angel Records and some phenomenal records when he was very young. So uh, I was, and then I remember taking lessons from Christopher Parkening over at his house in the San Fernando Valley and And uh, one day I'm taking a lesson. I'm I'm like 17, getting ready to try to go to USC when I'm 18. I'm, and now I'm a you know I'm, I'm primarily an electric guitar player. I'm you know into jazz. I'm into rock. I'm I'm into everything. I'm not as confident on the classical end, but I'm studying with Chris, this great classical guitarist, and he, he's very cool and giving me a lesson. And all of a sudden, out I remember looking. We were in his living room, and outside of his living room. Uh, this pink Cadillac convertible drives by and all these guys are in the pink Cadillac convertible yelling at, hey, Chris, come out. We got him. We're going to hang. Come. And I and I said, who are those guys? And he said, oh, don't pay attention. To those. those are the Romeros. Those are the famous flamenco guitar players, you know. So it was Pepe Romero and Angel Romero and, you know, some of the greatest flamenco guitar players uh, on the planet. 
and and they just wanted to go out and party, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice. I, I'm reading some of the comments people sending it. They are really surprised uh, with the sweetness of the music while you're talking. I mean, you can play whatever you want <laughs> and always in a smooth and fascinating way. And especially, you're always smiling. Uh, it impresses me a lot. Thanks well, a lot to I'm, me. I mean, there's a lot to not smile about this year. But, uh, you know, when I talk about the guitar... And when I talk about how fortunate my life has been, uh, you know, to make music the whole time. And uh, so I, I think it's actually, with all the stuff that's going on this year, especially in the last few years uh, for everybody, but especially this year and, and in the U.S. here with kind of this incredible politics and then the pandemic. And and uh, it it's one thing that... I think uh, got drowned out a lot was music, and and so I think now that things are quieting down a little bit, I mean people are obviously they're you know some countries are worse than others. The U.S. is not particularly good right now, and we've had an incredible amount of illness and death, and everybody is out of work, and you know you can go on and on and on. But uh, it seems like. Uh, you know, Listening to more music, playing more music, is is some of the best medicine in the world. Yeah, it is. I guess it's very true. And the guitar? So. That, that's it, man. You know, that's the instrument. <laughs> that I'll get some some pushback from the drummers out there, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess the music can heal people. I mean, even. Uh, oh yeah. Spiritually, yeah, just not something you get. From um, it's not just an, an hobby, even if it's for someone a hobby, you know. But That's it, right. it gives you a lot on your life. It gives some passion. It gives uh, emotions and uh, even a different style. You, you need to listen to people to play with. So I guess it's it's very different. Yeah, actually, okay. uh, to to players out there, I I really recommend you know it, it now we're all sort of in the same boat the the playing field has been leveled in the sense that we're all uh online and and doing everything online and this is amazing that we can stream all over the world and and answer questions and demonstrate and play a little bit and and i don't take that for granted it's fantastic but you know people getting together and playing music and having an audience because i i haven't done yet I, i i'm planning on it in the new year to do more but uh you, you know where the band gets together and we stream somewhere and we do a performance right and so so that's fine you know that's done every day but what's missing still is the the band playing with each other is one thing and musicians playing with one another me bouncing off the guitar the guitar and the drums and the bass and the singer and everything that that's what musicians get together and do but the other component is the audience So the audience drives the musicians, the musicians drives the audience. It really is uh, a co-partnership, you know, and, and people think that there's this line between the audience and the music, musicians on stage. There really isn't, you know, so because even if the music... It's a big interplay. Yeah, the, and even if the music is, let, let's say it's a very controlled pop or R&B or hip-hop or something that's very... Everything's programmed and there's a lot of dancing on stage, you know, the modern version of making a stage performance. But I'm telling you, you do that at a at a rehearsal room where there's a couple of crew guys out in the audience and, and the manager and the lawyer and the record company guy and and the rest is is on stage and 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 they're going through the motions of trying to get it better and you know, rehearse and get it right or even do some kind of performance that's online. It's not the same as having that audience there. Yeah, of course. I agree. Yeah, I'm missing that too. So, Lee, your improvisational skills are known to all. But what happens inside you just before you start playing the first notes? I mean, what is the big bang inside you that makes your creativity explode? And how has it changed over the these long years? I mean, well... There's several questions in that question, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'll give you time to speak and play. You, 
got this guitar as well? Yeah, I got it. It sounds awesome. This is the Sadowski. So the, the main question is, what is the inspiration for the improvisation or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you start, when you approach a new uh, improvisation in, over a song or with other musicians, uh, how do you start? How do you approach? You just place the hands, you think about phrasing, uh, you, you just let it go? Well, it depends on basically what kind of music you're playing, what kind of song you're playing, what kind of band you're playing with and uh, even what the environment is you know what if you're playing at a small uh, very small club uh, where there's you know 75 people in the club or, or 100 people or something like like the famous club here the baked potato that a lot of the guys play at you know half the people in the audience are musicians and so the guys on stage play slightly different you know the you know, and, and, and then if you're playing at a, a very big festival or a big uh, theater, uh, you know, an outdoor theater like here in Los Angeles, like the Hollywood Bowl, it's 17,000 people. So, you know, as a, as a band leader, I've learned to sort of also what are you trying to reach, you know, the, the broad strokes for the, the bigger audience because there might be Lee Rittenauer fans there that are, really into every little thing I do from maybe the guitar point of view or a song point of view or know my records intimately and then there'll be the guy sitting next to them that you know hardly knows anything about me and so they both have to have a reaction and so you can't take into consideration 17,000 people all in one breath nor can you take into consideration uh, that uh, Dave Weckl or Vinnie Caliuto walked in the room at the baked potato and now our drummer is going to overplay to show off that he, <laughs> he's, he's, he can play like Vinnie or Dave, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, which we can be shaking that. from a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and I, I can tell some guitar stories about that too. So, um, but, uh, y y y so, again to get back to the question you, you want to take people on a journey and you, when you're improvising and and uh, you want to take the the band on a journey and the band wants to be able to take you on a journey so it, it really is the interplay you know so so for instance uh, the guitar and the piano are always two instruments that are are very important together so some guitar players like to have just a guitar trio whether it's a guitar power trio or a jazz trio or whatever it is where they can dictate the the harmony and the melody all at once but then but then most of us work also you know with keyboard players or piano players so so it's important that you have a piano player in the band that is giving you the the right response to back you up and feed off of you harmonically and rhythmically and giving you the space and so that's why my buddy, uh, the famous Dave Grusin, was always such an amazing accompanist because he'd always lay the right chords with the right harmony, with the right voicings, and give you the right space. So you always have to play with musicians, whether they're young or old, that listen, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, today uh, in the bass player world, there's so many phenomenal bass players out there, you know, and again, the bass players have as much chops as the guitar players, sometimes more, you know, and and that's fine, you know, I mean, I, I, I was a, when Jaco Pastorius, Pastorius uh, came on the scene and, and I got to record with him the first time, it was like, there had never been anybody li really like him, you know. And sta sta same <laughs> yeah. with Stanley, same with Stanley Clark. You know, they, they reinvented the the way people looked at the bass, you know. But again, when it's time for the bass solo, you know, we would try to accompany the bass solo in the right way. When it's time for the guitar solo, I expect the bass player and the keyboard to to give me room, you know. And if, if all of a sudden the piano player and the bass player and the drummer are taking up too much space and they're not leaving this big hole for the guitar player to, 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 to find his way, you know. Interesting, 
years ago I, I played down in Nashville and uh, I did a session with the Nashville rhythm section and it was they weren't the, the most well-known players and, and they weren't technically, you know, all-star, superstar players. But I noticed when I did this session and I, and I went to play the melody, all of a sudden there was all this space around me. <laughs> they were playing, they were there, but they were used to working with country singers, especially, uh, you know, big, big voice uh, guys and girls, singers, and and so they were used to leaving plenty of room for the singer, you know. And so when they were accompanying me, the guitar player playing the lead, all of a sudden there was also the space, like I was the singer. And I, n- I never forgot that because in today's world, everybody when they're programming on the computer, whether it's on Pro Tools or Logic, or you got playing in a band. And everybody wants to show what they can do. So sometimes they want to get space. Yeah, and so all of a sudden the space is all gone. You know, so so that's the worst thing for me when I play with people and all of a sudden they're not listening and and they're taking up all the room and it's like, okay, well maybe I'll just come back tomorrow. You know. <laughs> so anyway, I, I kind of diverge from the the thing, but. Y- Improvisation is is being inspired, you know, and and it really is a variation on the melody. Whatever the kind of music you're playing, if it's a, 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 a blues tune and or or if it's a jazz fusion tune or if it's a heavy metal piece, of course the metal pieces are more worked out than anything these days, and there's some fantastic stuff going on there too. But uh, you know, it's it's about it's about presenting the right improvisation and the right sound and the right melody within the right song and the right rhythm section. It's a, it's all about orchestration. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I agree. Yeah, with all, all the fantastic musicians you are play, playing with, with in this so many years, I guess you always found people able to listen properly and get give and get the, the space when it was the proper time. Yeah, well, and and you know, it, it's it's the same thing in life. You know, you you get attracted to somebody because you have something in common. So, bass players and drummers, it's the very very important that bass players and drummers f- like to play with each other because the you know they have to feel the time the same. They have to understand where the bass and the bass drum uh, work out, and and they get you know. And it's it's magical when four or five musicians actually get together and they and all of a sudden, that was when I was in the group four play with uh, Bob James and Harvey Mason, Nathan East, and myself, is that the we didn't talk about anything, but when we made that first record, it was like there was all this sort of common uh, shared experience that we knew how the four pieces would fit together. And even though I had my style and Bob had his style and Harvey was very identifiable in his style and Nathan East had his style, it, it, the, the group had a its own sound. The, the four of us became a group sound. And uh, that that doesn't happen very often, you know. Uh, you know, obviously very popular bands out there over the years, when you go back and look at them, of course the Beatles had the Beatles sound, you know, Ringo didn't sound that way by himself, and, and uh, even it was Paul, inside the Beatles. Yeah, it was the Beatles sound. And same with the Stones, and you know, any of the any of the great bands, Led Zeppelin, you know, you name it, you know. Uh, look at Paul Desmond and Dave Brubeck. You know, every time I hear a Brubeck record, and you know, and, and it, it, it's like those guys. Yeah, indeed. You got. You nearly got me the next question <laughs> already done because I wanted to talk about sound, especially because your tone is always extremely recognizable. You know, can you give us some hints about to develop a unique and personal sound like yours, and of course, how you did that? Well, um, it's interesting. I, I when I was. It goes back all the time, all the way back to Los Angeles in the sense that when I was eight years old, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, you know, the guitar was exploding with sound, you know. And so I, re- I think I was 16 when I drove up, and uh, by this time I was driving the car, and I drove a, my dad's car in the driveway after high school one day, and all of a sudden, 
Purple Haze comes on and, you know, you hear Hendrix's sound and as you go, what was that? You know, and that, that was that was like way beyond all of us, you know, <laughs> but to hear it for the first time, you know, but I was always into the guitar sound. And, and so, um, you know, when I heard B.B. King, he was just so identifiable and he had such a style, you know, and, and then my dad took me to hear Wes Montgomery at this famous club, The Lighthouse, and uh, uh, which I named a song uh, recently on the new album. And, and so, you know, to hear Wes, he, there were so many great jazz guitar players at that time when I was a teenager growing up, and, and you know, Wes and Kenny Burrell and Jim Hall and Barney Kessel. Yeah, and the old, the old yeah, school. Gabor, Zabo, all the old school guys, you know, all the, all the famous guys. And, and then guys like Wes Montgomery, you know, they, it was Charlie Christian before that that played in Benny Goodman's band that, you know, so that, that goes all the way back to the, almost the beginning of jazz guitar. So, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, all the, 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 the guitar players that are playing today, you know, all the young cats, you know, they're, di- they're just phenomenal, you know. And, and, and then in my time frame, you know, whether it was uh, other L.A. guys like uh, Larry Carlton, who lived almost like 15 minutes from me, we grew up in almost in the same area. And then... Uh, You've uh, made also a fantastic album together. Yeah, no, that, and, uh, you know, I, yeah, that we had on uh, Spotify the other day and one of those cuts came uh, on the radio the other day and, and, it, was, and uh, it was Larry and I and, and uh, I said, yeah, that was a pretty nice record. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, across the country was, it was Schofield and Athene and, and uh, of course, Mike Stern and, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, and then George Benson, you know, it was like, whew. And then I was close with, with George. I, I played a lot on his records and had him on my Six String Theory record. And, and, uh, so it, it, but talking about the sound, it, so all these guys, I was influenced by their sound, especially Wes Montgomery. And, you know, because Wes, I, I would go to the club and, and, and he'd be playing with the thumb and, you know, just amazing stuff with the, the, the thumb. And, 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 have this little amp uh, you know like a little fender amp or whatever it was at the time and it was just this amazing sound coming out of the uh, out of the guitar and and I, I realized I said okay it's it's not the guitar it's not the amp it's certainly not the effects there were no effects back in those days and and it was just this pure tone that he was getting through the uh, the guitar and then I ended up studying a lot of classical guitar and I think that technique uh, of just getting a, a good sound on the guitar period you know and and that would translate later because whether it was in rock you know if you were listening to Clapton or Beck or or Hendrix you know they they all had great sound you know, so, so, you know, and, and how do you get a great sound? Well, that's where the studying comes in of, 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 of really, and sometimes it's not about the technique, it's not about playing fast, you know, sometimes yeah, learning how to play slow and, and get a big fat tone, you know, it's like, I'll never forget one day I went to, uh, I, was, uh, I think it was some kind of benefit and, and uh, it was at a theater and it was just piano players, and there weren't too many people in the audience. It was some sort of very specific benefit, and uh, there was like seven or eight uh, great jazz pianists uh, sitting down at this wonderful Yamaha uh, piano, and uh, and so and I, I won't name the other people, but some very famous names, and and somewhere sort of deep into the set list, uh, into the set. Dave Grusin got up and played, and Dave has always been, he 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 was a, also had a very big classical background, and then he also was influenced by Bill Evans and 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 all the guys again with the great sound, and so when he, so he learned how to play the piano and get a great sound. So when after all these like five or six or seven incredible pianists got up and they were all phenomenal, and then Dave got up and nothing had changed. The mics hadn't changed. The 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 volume on the speakers didn't change you know the setting for the piano didn't change he just sat down at the piano and 
he he sat down at the piano and his sound was so much warmer and bigger than than the previous five or six other piano players had played and so and the whole audience went you know it was that noticeable so it was like t tone matters you know and why did hendrix have that tone why did clapton why did beck why did west montgomery why did segovia you know why on hill romero it's like the the, the tone Matheny, you know it's carlton me schofield you know it, 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 it's what you play but it also it's 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 that sound of the fingers on the instrument so it's it's our voice you know it, it, instead of singing we're playing so and how did you develop this uh, unique sound you have because i can understand it, that it's you playing in a, in a record just with two three measures of music you know so how did you develop this specific sound your unique taste for for the this tone i mean well um how did i develop that tone it, It's a, it's a really hard question to answer. It's, you know, 60 years of playing the guitar, but I was, like I said, as a kid, I was always attracted to the tone. So your, your ear, you know, it's like, the only thing I could say to the students is if you're attracted to uh, a certain sound, a certain blues guy or a certain jazz or rock or metal or whatever, it, and they have a certain sound that, that you like, You just have to travel to that sound, you know, you have to try to figure out, and, you know, is it the guitar? Is it the amp? Is it the effects? Is it the pedal board? I mean, of, of course, all that stuff helps, you know. Uh, of course, you have to have uh, a, a good instrument, and, 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 and today, you know, of course, there's, there's tons of fantastic uh, equipment out there, and, and guitars, and amps, and effects that are, are not too expensive and and some people are doing some amazing work with them because they, they they keep getting crazier and crazier every year and so I, i love that but uh the the tone is is and how somebody's style is it's their voice you know so uh again you studying the instrument and and learning how to pick properly and how to finger with your right hand and how to finger properly with your uh, your left hand and and, and and practicing slowly and practicing skill. these are things that you know really can't be copied from just watching YouTube you know so you, it takes you, to there, say that yeah you you just have to put the time in you know and I think if I was If I was 13 years old today, I'd be all over the internet. I'd, of course, I'd be watching stuff like this, and I'd, you know, I have a, a 27-year-old son, Wes, who, you know, plays drums in my band, and and him and his buddies, all his age group, all everybody in their 20s, they're, you know, they're 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 on the internet watching music, you know, 24 hours a day, and I'm sure I would be the same, but um, it does not uh, it does not mean that you uh, you you can't you have to still put the time in you know and and so uh for me and most of the guitar players that i know that that are popular and well known uh we, we just play the guitar all the time you know so i yeah, see <laughs> yeah yeah so i've noticed yeah and and so that from the time i was 12 uh you know i i i, I was like i was just practicing constantly you know and, and studying and and of course i was taking lessons and and playing with whoever i could and and uh is so and especially these days you know it's it's harder and harder to uh there's so many great guitar players and musicians around the world now and so many of them are you know are very very good and Some of them are amazing, and, uh, and 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 you also have to sort of decide. You know, not everyone is meant to be also uh, this incredible virtuoso soloist. You know, sometimes you're going to be a songwriter and you're going to write songs on the guitar. Sometimes you're going to be in a band, you know, accompanying the the the, the, the lead singer, whether it's male or female, and and and, and you, you know, but. Anything you can do in an outstanding way, you know, will stick out, you know, so, and, and 
also uh, having that versatility today. Uh, and you can't you can't get that just staying in your bedroom, you know. So on on the other hand, I also said when you know none of us in our lives have gone through anything like this pandemic where we're all at home and and I, I I know that if if I was a teenager and I was home now and school was not happening, man, I this would be in my hand play all day. like to fourteen hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Lee, just a small question from a from a friend in our chat, Juzmar. While you're using that guitar, highly nice to meet you on Music Off. A question: What kind of guitar are you playing? Cause sounds very good. Yeah, this is a. a Roger Sadowski, you know, he's a famous guitar maker in in the US and uh, uh, you might have seen the he also became famous for his basses, uh, the Sadowski basses and uh, also uh, the silent guitars that are uh, the, the nylon guitars that are pretty much are just electric and uh, so he, he uh, always had a, a, a great uh, uh, ear for for making jazz guitars and basses and his nylon guitars and so uh, this is an SS15 and and through the years I had used uh, of course the Yamaha guitars and, and primarily uh, for the electric guitars Gibson but uh, uh, Roger is is definitely uh, in the US uh, one of the custom makers that just makes fantastic uh, guitars yeah, he's a, an artist itself and it sounds you amazing know, and it's funny because you know some of the things that are very important to somebody like me that records a lot is how even uh, his guitars are and uh And then that, uh, the uh, Yamaha acoustic that I had up was the same way. It's, it's like, uh, you know, the, the pickups that they're making, that started with the silent guitars that Yamaha was making, and then their acoustic guitars and stuff. They, a, lot of, a lot of companies are combining the electronics and the acoustic quality so well today. Very different than the original Fenders and the Gibsons, which yeah, of course. Were, the, were, you know, the... The, the originators of all these great guitars you know and of course I I still um, when I had the f fire in 2018 at the at the house and studio, uh, studio in California um, and I, I lost so many instruments but I I did take out the seven guitars that uh, were some of the most important ones to me and and uh, and and that was my 49 l5 that my dad got me when I was 13 and uh, and, uh, and then uh, my 335, the, the, the dot inlay that was on so many sessions. and Your milestones instrument. Yeah. And, and then the, the Les Pauls. And, and uh, so, and the funny thing is that I told Yamaha uh, not too long ago that I said, and I took out your, uh, not this one that I was playing now, but this other one, NCX3, I think it was. And it's a relatively inexpensive guitar, you know, it's like a thousand dollars, which for the compared to some of these guitars is not too expensive but uh, and and uh, I took that guitar with me that night because not not that it was quote unquote the greatest guitar in the world but I was writing songs on it for the new record and and uh, it was it's a, it was a very inspirational guitar so you know how sometimes you just have an, a guitar that inspires you to write so <laughs> it doesn't matter if it costs five hundred dollars or fifty thousand If, if, if it inspires you to play, inspires you to, to write a song and, and, and you enjoy it, it makes you feel something, that's, the, that's a good instrument. Yeah, I, I just read a question like, uh, where do you get inspiration from composing, for, from, um, for composing music? And I, I was curious about that and you answered a bit. I mean, also the instruments have, a, a, have their own parts on the composition process for you. Yeah, well, I don't have this one plugged in at the moment, but uh, we were talking earlier about baritone or about uh, Taylor and uh, another incredible 
company. So this is a, a baritone that's tur uh, tuned down a, of a fourth below. So it's a lower sound. So on my new album, Dreamcatcher, uh, I, I ended up writing um, songs that uh, sometimes on, on an instrument like this because it, it, it makes you, you hear different, you know. It's like a simple C chord. And, you know, instead of... There's, there's the simplest chord that a guitar player can play, right? But all of a sudden, you hit the, the C, the G, and the E, and on the baritone, that's really, a, you know, it's really, it's a fourth below, so it's really a G chord. And so all of a sudden, you start to hear the resonance different, you know, and it is inspired. So, so I have a tune called Starlight. It's just on the vocal mic right now you're hearing them yeah some s someone just said what a sound and let me say that this is the only instrument is not plugged in because we had a little problem with a battery just before the the live yeah. streaming the, so the, you are you are picking the sound of that that guitar from the microphone lee is using for talking and eh, guys so yeah the and, sound and is in is in the end in the hands yeah <laughs> But yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. so and, and we we were testing a few guitars I had here to 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 demonstrate today, and and all of a sudden the the nine volt battery went out, and I looked around in this room. And I said, Oh my God, I don't have a new nine volt battery. Anybody got a battery? And <laughs> and uh, so we we couldn't. Uh, but the sound uh, plugged in, and that's usually the way I record with the acoustic these days. Is most of these companies like T Taylor and Yamaha and and some of the others, they, they, they're making phenomenal guitars with the pickups, uh, acoustic guitars. But then also, you know, if they're, they're great sonic sounding guitars, and if you have a great tone, then, of course, you can mic it with a good mic. Like we're, right now we're using a Sheps microphone a Sheps. A, as a talkback mic, but normally when I was ra making the new Dreamcatcher record, I would have uh, two Sheps mics here and, and the DI and um, kind of blend the, 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 the three th elements, and that would end up creating a, a nice hybrid sound that, that is more up my alley. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious about your guitars because uh, um, you've been also with Yamaha for a very long time now, and you developed also quite a few other collaborations too. It will be, fa it will be nice to have some of the gear secrets <laughs> shared with the friends. I mean, just not only guitars, but also amps you have been using in the in the in your record records and live, also pedals, whatever you need, you need to show. Yeah, well, I don't have everything uh, set up in this room. You know, like when the f I had my sort of full-on studio back in the in the Malibu when the, when the fire happened, and uh, we, we I only had time to pull out a few things, and and. Uh, but my traveling pedal board is, is uh, the company Exotic put together for me, and it has n numerous pedals on it that, that travel with me uh, uh, when I'm uh, doing concerts and stuff. So that's not set up uh, currently right now, but th that was rebuilt uh, for me um, by the guys at Exotic. And, and uh, Fender was nice enough to uh, uh, bring back my twin reverbs, and then I... I have a custom Ladner over here, which is out of a small uh, mom and pop. I will, uh, not, I will not ask you to bring it because I know it's heavy. Yeah, no. If I get up here and start lugging, say, yeah, forget about it. And then, uh, and then Mesa Boogie is another company that I love, and and uh, they've been uh, very helpful and generous uh, since the fire. You know, because I I lost about forty amps and about a hundred guitars and uh, every pedal that I had ever owned, and, and so it was like. Okay, so you know, so I, I really had to start from scratch again, which, which is actually kind of, you know, in a way, when I did the solo guitar record, it was, it was like all the playing fields were leveled. You know, it was like I had to uh, understand what the way everybody because I also had this incredible board that I had done all my records on the Trident Series eighty, and I could try to replace all of that, but you know, I, it's just like we're live streaming here, right? Times change, yeah. keep changing. So, um, you know, and of course, I, I'm a fan of Logic Audio and Pro Tools and all the music software, and and so I, I get around on it fairly well. 
and and so long as I can get my music done, you know, and I can get my sound and my tone, and whether it's through and I like I I use Apogee's, uh, so the modern version of 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 studio now. Uh, yes. we have, I'm using Apogee Symphony I O, which is you know the high end part of the Apogee company as a interface, and and it's going into uh, the, a Mac computer and uh, uh, and and Logic Audio, and 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 I use wonderful Genelec speakers here. Then the Genelec people were uh, right away they they loaned me a pair of Genelecs and at this rental house and it's a you know it's a nice rental place but it's not a studio like i used to have but it you know so but when i made the solo record it was almost apropos because uh again it had to get down to the tunes the player and and the tone you know and the songs so it it was like all the other stuff sort of fell by the wayside yeah you you had for the Dreamcatcher album. I mean, the most important things. You have the songs. You had the musician. <laughs> you had the instruments and the tune and the tone. I mean, and uh, of course, if, even if, if everything changes, uh, it's not the, the Malibu studio anymore. I remember that studio. It was hey. very old style. I mean, all analog with many many albums and uh, yeah and records inside. So, but I guess the music uh, has survived the barn absolutely and and in fact inspired by it you know and from it so so that that's very cool and uh i'm gonna just take out the les paul here for a second so i can noodle while we talk <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was getting i was getting um, mad yeah. about not play you're not playing anymore <laughs> yeah well you, you know that i can i can tell a story about actually noodling and talking you know so It was it's funny. I, I grew up as a, a studio guy, right? But, uh, you know, I, I always loved to play live. And, and so ever since I was a kid in Los Angeles, I was playing uh, parties and, and uh, different kinds of uh, uh, casuals, you know, whether it was weddings or stuff. And I met some of the most amazing musicians. You know, I, I remember meeting uh, David Page from the group Toto, uh, on a casual at this place, the Queen Mary, which was this huge ship in, mm. in, in Long Beach, right? And, uh, and, and then I, I met uh, Steve Lukather when uh, Steve was, I think, 16 and I was 19 or something. And, uh, and, and, uh, and then Patrice Russian, the great pianist, uh, we were, she was 14, and, and Dugo Chancellor, who's passed now, but he was 16 when we met. And all these L.A. players, you know, were... We, and then other fantastic guitar players, Mitch Holder and Tim May, and uh, you know, and then later uh, Ray Parker Jr. Uh, he moved out from from Detroit, and, and I met him on a Motown session, and uh, and and the uh, the famous arranger Gene Page introduced us, and and he said, Lee, I want you to meet this young guitar player, Ray Parker Jr. And Ray was 19, and I think I was uh, 21 or something like that. And uh, Ray turns around with me with that big smile and shakes my hand, and he says, "I'm Ray Parker Jr. I'm the greatest guitar player in the world." And and I looked at him and I said, "Nice to meet you, Ray. I'm Lee Rittenauer." And I said, "We'll see about that." <laughs> and, and and then we became fast friends to this day. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you do you want to? If you play something on Le on Les Paul, so we can uh, hear the tune you have over there. Well, let's see. Oh, I'm, I was going to tell the story. Yeah, so. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> At least you promised. Yeah, hang on for a minute. <laughs> That's too much level. It's okay. That's okay. So this is uh, right now. I'm I'm just plugged in direct. Um, Uh, going through the Strymon Iridium uh, again, you know, all these companies are, are doing some fantastic work these days. And uh, these guys that uh, started Strymon, I think, really came out of the some of them out of the uh, Line Six and the Yamaha divisions, and, and now they have this whole great company and and uh, you know just great equipment and effects keep coming, and and uh, especially now that everybody's online and everybody's doing even more you know it's like 
it, it's uh, phenomenal what's what's coming out and being developed, you know. So, uh, you know. So when I was working on the when I was working on the Dreamcatcher album. I was, you know, I, I primarily started first on the Yamaha acoustic guitar, and I was composing the last few years, and, and people kept encouraging me to do a solo guitar record, so I had some pieces, and I, so I was finally recording, and then the whole shutdown thing started, uh, you know, had happened, and, and the last couple of years had been challenging anyway with the fire in Malibu, and, and uh, you know, uh, just all sorts of stuff going on, so, so finally... The shutdown's happening, and I, um, now I've got my studio rebuilt here, uh, you know, a temporary studio while we're rebuilding the house. And, and so I had pretty much everything up and running, and I'm starting to re work on the record. And and now we're, we're all shut down, and it's like it, it, the whole world is shut down for the first time. And, and I'm hearing that every major city, you know, whether it's in Rome or uh, or Paris or New York or Tokyo, it's like everybody's home, and it's like... So I said, I can't believe this. So I, I get out on my bicycle one day, and this is in March of, uh, like late March, early April of uh, 2020, mm -hmm. right, this year. And so I take a bike ride over to Venice, California, and uh, there's a very famous uh, street there called Abbot Kinney, uh, and it's it's a very, it, you know, it's lots of cafes and restaurants and people all over the place, and and uh, bars and, s and shops and just it's a great great little street you know and and I walked I drove my bike over there and it was completely I think my wife and I dro we drove our bikes over there and it was completely empty it was like there was no cars there was no people everything was starting to get boarded up and and I was just like wow and I started thinking about all these big cities around the world that were also empty and all my friends that were stuck home and and uh, you know everybody, we all went through the same thing, right? And uh, so, so, so I'm sitting there, almost getting depressed, like hoping that a bike ride was going to make me feel better. But I was thinking about all this, experiencing this, and seeing it firsthand that this street was empty. Then all of a sudden, upstairs in some apartment, I guess uh, that I didn't even know existed up above a storefront, I, somebody had taken out their guitar. It sounded like a Les Paul. But I don't know if it was. But it, it, somebody had turned up to ten and said, "Heck with it! I'm, I'm going to play." And, and and I don't know if it was a kid or an adult. They sounded pretty good, whoever it was, and they just were rocking out. And the sound was bouncing up and down, uh, Abbott Kinney. And uh, uh, and so I went home. I couldn't get that sound out of my head. And I'm, you know, I'm already I'm working on the record. And I said, "Shit! I wonder if I could do a solo guitar piece with that kind of sound and that kind of style a little bit." And so that's what inspired the song Abbott Kenny that's on the record, you know. So, and uh, it was interesting because <laughs> I, I was really. <laughs> so I, I put up the iridium and and uh, on some little distortion and uh, uh, compressor and a little delay and reverb on on Logic Audio and uh, and that was it, you know. <laughs> So, and it was interesting, I was going to tell one guitar type thing about composition. So this, this, this kind of chord right here, that's like, let's just do it in this position down here. So that's a, a, G, a G9 in, in first inversion, or, or if you just play it, it's also B minor 7 flat 5. But that that formation, okay. So in the middle of the tune, if you hear the record, it's I do this part where it goes. So it's all the same chord, you know, just.
know, again, composition ends up being at the it's center of the well. stuff, you know. So, uh, you know, that's... The and it's funny, every, you know, talking about chord voicings and, and sound on the guitar and compositions, uh, every great guitar player that I've ever uh, been around or got to know, whether it's Steve Lukather or Joe Bonamassa or Schofield or Matheny or whoever it is, not only, not only does everyone have their style and their own phrasing and, and the way they play, and, and of course if they also sing like a, a, a George Benson or, or Bonamassa or something like that, but uh, also j the way they voice their chords, you know, so, and that ends up yeah. being important in their writing. And the songwriting, you know, you can go back to Joni Mitchell, you can go back to Bob Dylan, you can go back to the most famous songwriters, the Beatles, whoever it is, if they picked up a guitar and wrote songs, uh, a lot of times it, it, it has to do with their voicings, you know. So uh, I used to run into Joni Mitchell at this particular restaurant in Los Angeles, and, and uh, I didn't work with her as much as some of people, but we knew each other and worked together a little bit. And, and of course, everyone was a fan of Joni Mitchell over the years, right? And she wrote all these incredible lyrics and tunes. <laughs> and and uh, so there was a record, I think it was called Smoke and Mirrors years ago in the middle 2000s that I did. And I was experimenting with some different guitar tunings. And and uh, and, and I ran into Joni. And, a, and I think on that record, I did like three or four different guitar tunings or something. on, And that was unusual for me. I didn't do too much of that kind of stuff. And so I ran into Joni and I... Uh, and I said, hey, Joni, I, I'm working on this new record, and I kind of stole a little bit from you. Uh, I said, I, I tried some different guitar tunings in, in honor of what, you know, some of your writing. And, and, uh, and she said, she said why, why did you want to do that, Lee? She said, you know, you know all the chords. The only reason I do these tunings is because I don't know the chords. <laughs> <laughs> and so she <laughs> she said she tuned her guitar different ways so that she could play a, a simple chord and it would sound different. And, and so I understood what she was talking about. It would, you know, you play a a, a tune on, on a guitar with the, uh, the the G string all of a sudden turned to an A. You know, it's it's going to make you hear it differently when you play that same chord. So she related to that. But then. And then I was all proud that I had had four or five, six tunings on the record or whatever it was. And uh, and then she, she said, yeah, you know, somebody just did a book on uh, my guitar tunings. And I forget what the number was. She said it was like, I think I had like 147 tunings or something. <laughs> I said, okay, okay Joni, you know, you're Joni Mitchell. Okay, yeah, later. <laughs> so, you know, you learn. And then... Talking about old famous stories, Bob Dylan used to come into, recently his catalog just was bought, I think, by Universal for zillions of dollars, right? And and all these incredible tunes that we still hear that young artists still cover today. And, and you know, he's, he's more than a legend, you know, he's just one of those guys that will live forever like the Beatles, you know. And, and so Dylan used to come into the Baked Potato, which is this little club that's famous in L.A., where we all used to play in the early days, right? And uh, so this was in the 70s, and, you know, this was like the beginning of jazz fusion. And so I'm, I'm playing there with Abraham Laboreal and then, you know, Harvey Mason and then Vinnie Caluda and Anthony Jackson and and and, 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 and Dave Grusin and, you know, John Beasley and all these, Patrice Russian and all Quite these, company. you know, <laughs> Ernie Watts and all these great musicians that came through the, the baked potato. And then, you know, around that time, Carlton was playing there, and then later, Lukather would be playing there, and, you know, every, you know, Robin Ford, and uh, just all these great guitar players and, and drummers and bass players and musicians would play at that place. And so sometimes when I was playing there, Dylan would come in and sit in the corner by himself. And years later, I I, I asked, and everyone would say, Dylan's here. And I said, wow, that's so unusual, because you'd get some of the rock guys come through, it gets a lot of jazz guys that come through. You get a lot of fans that just came up. But, you know, not usually somebody like Bob Dylan. Even Joni would come by to those kind of places, but not Dylan. And so later I asked Dylan when I ran into him, I said, Bob, you used to come to the Baked Potato. What was that all about? And he said, I like guitar. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, so. <laughs> 
So you live and learn. Uh, I guess you, you you may go ahead for 24 hours and telling stories or just just talking about Malibu or Los Angeles in those years. Uh, I guess there are thousands, tens of thousands of stories like this one. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, getting us talking, a, any of us uh, talking about the day uh, with, with doing sessions and... and and having all these great musicians, you know. But, hey, there's, you know, I have this, before maybe we wrap up, uh, I, I have this uh, foundation called Six String Theory, and uh, for it's been going on since the, uh, since we did the, uh, the Six String Theory record in uh, 2010, and, and uh, we've supported young musicians all over the world, and, and, uh, We, right now we have a, a free little contest with that tune uh, Starlight that I played on baritone a little bit and uh, uh, it's up there for anybody who wants to take a crack at it and, and do their version of it and uh, Yamaha's a sponsor and you can win a guitar and uh, an entrance to our next uh, main competition which will be uh, the yeah, let me send let me send the link for this contest uh, I will uh i will just share the, the screen so people can see it because this is an amazing idea lee had with the just b just a little before the release of the dream catcher mm -hmm. album it's an international contest and i guess we still have time isn't it it's uh until yeah, yeah. Ja january 15th yeah no it, it, yeah it's open until january 15th and and then uh and, and we actually uh uh You know, I, I really want to have different kinds of players. It's a very simple tune. It's on baritone, but you can play it on jazz guitar. You could play it with a group. You could play it with a, uh, a rock version, a blues version. You could do it through programming as long as you're doing the playing. And, uh, you know, any kind of inspiration. Because, again, it was one of those tunes where... That's the way the tune opens. I did it on the baritone, right? And I, I named it after uh, my studio, Starlight Studio, that went up in the fire. So it had a, a lot of feeling behind it. And, uh, and I, but mainly, uh, I, I, I'm so... Uh, fascinated by all the musicians all over the world that are, are making music and and uh it's very different than i said earlier uh, when i was competing with other guitar players in la or new york or nashville or a little bit london you'd hear about san francisco uh, and and once in a while you know somebody would pop out of another country brazil of course and uh but the now you know it's just great musicians and inspirational musicians and and players learning all over the world and of course it has a lot to do with the fact that you know we're all connected with with the internet but also you know records and music and musicians are are more uh, taking in the spirit of of everything around the world more easily you know it used to you would hear more contaminations yeah <laughs> exactly and yeah, good and bad and Yeah, right. <laughs> can you can you pick some? Can you say some names or musicians you admire? Maybe even younger than you. I mean, well, there, there's there, there's there's plenty, you know, and there's amazing piano players and uh, guitar players and, and different instruments coming out of Israel these days, and uh, certainly out of Germany and Japan and and. It's like, and, I, and that's why my six string theory really exists because it was a chance to uh, have these six categories of, of jazz guitar, rock guitar, and uh, uh, acoustic guitar, and classical, and uh, rhythm, and blues, and uh, almost any style that you play the guitar, you could enter the competition. Then we expanded it to uh, piano, bass, and drums, and... and uh, You know, it's it's we we have musicians who have won from Serbia and from Ireland and just all over the place, let alone all over the United States, but uh, Canada and South America. And, you know, yeah, 
you know, I'm married to a, a Brazilian, and and uh, my my son is half Brazilian and a drummer, right? And so there's a lot of, and in my entire life, there's always been a lot of connection to uh, Brazilian musicians, and and there was always, you know, the always the the guys playing rhythm, the old. So, uh, you know, now there's Pedro Martins. There's just fantastic lead guitar players from Brazil. And when I was first going down there in the 70s, there was great guys playing rhythm like that. But uh, And there was the great songwriters like Showbeam and Milton Nascimento and, and then Yvonne Lins and Jovan and all these guys. But now there's uh, still equally great songwriters happening. But then you know, in amazing uh, lead players as well. And and, yeah. and that and that's pretty much happening all over the planet. And uh, so it's more important than ever that if a, mus- a musician wants to stick out and they want to be noticed and they want to uh, they want to uh, really kind of make it, um, especially as a as a leader or as a creator or a soloist or doing your own records and being having your own band it it's really important that you have your own style and so it's because of youtube and because of the internet it's so easy to copy these days and you know we've all (laughs) my buddy steve lucas there says he's yeah yeah i heard this three-year-old that was playing one of my solos the other day he was better than me you know it's like (laughs) because you know on youtube uh, first it was you know they were 15 years old and now they're 12 years old and then they were eight years old and then then there's a six-year-old playing some incredible you know classical piano <laughs> and so it's amazing how advanced uh the mind has become because of the internet uh but especially when it comes to copying uh so learning something to copy is and that's important you know it's good for the ear and it's it's good to be able to do that and, and the advancement but there's nothing like studying and, and understanding the depth of, of you know, like uh, of, of something to, to take it to the next level. You know, so that's why I think musicians have to continue to, to study, uh, you know, like I was never a classical guitarist. I don't consider myself a legit classical guitarist. I, you know, I was around people. I I went to Segovia's master classes a couple of times and sat in the back. You know, it's like, oh no no, don't, don't make me get up and play. <laughs> and you know, I studied with Christopher Park, and you know, I was around the Romeros and and Segovia and so, you know, so and and I was a fan of Sabikas and you know all these guys. And so, it, but I could never play with them. But it was important to study classical music, very important. And and studying classical guitar and getting that tone. Is, has helped me get a better guitar tone on electric, and it's definitely got the reason I have a, a better sound on on acoustic guitar. And then, and then writing your own tunes is so important, you know. So, uh, and sometimes, you know, when I'm working on an album, not so much this latest solo record because this was developed over the last few years, but it was really inspired because of the events the last couple of years. But um, but in general, when I'm writing for a record, sometimes I have to write six or seven or 10 or 15 tunes and all those get thrown out for so, before something good shows up. So that, that's, yeah, you so know, you so... You need to dig. Yeah. So sometimes, compo- or I mean, most of the time, composing is just like practicing. You know, the more you do it, the better you're at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I got some questions from, from the guys. There are very, very many questions now, but I'm picking time to time one to save it for a second moment like this one. And I guess this one is pretty nice from this Simone7, a lot from London. Do you always seem so relaxed when you play? There was a time where you were a bit tense and not so confident. Wait, was there a time? Yeah. Um well, my personality is, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm getting it right. And I remember as a kid getting so frustrated. I, I, I still, I don't know why I remember this, but uh, when I was 
seven years old, you know, my mom got me, a, or my dad and mom got me a ukulele, and my mom took out that little ukulele book, you know, where it showed the little chords in the box, and, and show, okay, put your finger here, put your finger here, put your finger, and I, I started crying, because I couldn't understand how you could put your fingers on the uh, on, 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 press on the, that hard. Yeah, and yeah. press that hard, and and and, and this was a frat, and that was a string, and I, I just that was I, I got so frustrated, you know, and I started to get you know frustrated and and started to cry, and and my I remember my dad saying, well, no, you don't have to play the ukulele if you don't want to. And I said, no, 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 I want to learn, and so I, I learned those chords on the ukulele, and and soon went to the guitar. So, but that's been kind of the mo. My whole life is that I, I'm I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna and I I always you know I was used to be a, a huge basketball f fan and my dad and I would go to see the Lakers games and we always had to, the the Lakers in those days we had Magic Johnson and you know there was all these incredible uh, players but then in Boston they had Larry Bird right and and uh, and and Larry Bird was that kind of guy that always had to practice more than the other guys to to be as good and of course he was better than <laughs> almost anybody but uh, but he had to practice that much more and and uh, that's that's been kind of my ammo I always had to practice a lot and that I practiced a lot and I was really prepared when I came on the scene so y y that's why I you know when you get that guitar in your hands, you know, just don't stop playing. Yeah, nice suggestion. And then uh, there is uh, Isabella Gracas asking to, do you remember your very first live performance? Uh, well, I'm not sure what she means by that exactly. Uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to, uh, again... When was it? Well, I, I was playing parties and, and casuals when I was, you know, 12 years old, which means uh, I played a lot of weddings, bar mitzvahs, and, uh, and, and you name it. And, uh, and so, you know, th there was always that, but we were always the background. Um, as far as playing at a... Uh, there was a famous club in Los Angeles called Dante's, and uh, it was down the street from what became the even more famous club and still is there today, the Baked Potato. But Dante's was kind of a studio musician's club, and I would go hang out there as a teenager, and then finally uh, guitarist John Paisano, uh, uh, who played with Peggy Lee and all these people and, and worked with Herb Albert, and, and uh, so he was playing there, and he asked me to, he'd heard about me, and he asked me to do one of his guitar Monday nights, and uh, so that was one of my, my first shows. And then I, I remember finally the famous uh, jazz guitarist Howard Roberts was playing there, and he got, I don't know, sick one night, and the owner called me and said, Lee, uh, Howard Roberts can't play tonight. Can you put a band together? And, of course, I, I didn't hardly have a band, but I said, yeah, I'll do it, you know. <laughs> and so I, I put something together, and I ended up playing it at Guitar Night that night. And... Uh, it's funny that that particular night, uh, Les Paul walked in the club, and 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 I said, "Oh my God, there's Les Paul! I had never met Les Paul." And years later, when he was in his 90s, I was talking to him at the Capitol Records, and and uh, I said, "Les, you're not going to remember this, but he." I said, "I, I want to tell you about the first time I met you." He said, "Oh no, I remember. You were that young kid playing at Dante's, and I walked in." Yeah. And that's, you know, and Les Paul was, you know, people, some organizations and hospitals wanted to study his mind because he had such an incredible memory way into his 90s. And, uh, you know, he just, he could remember everything and he would tell these incredible stories. So, uh, so yeah, playing, uh, I think it was, I think Dante's might have been one of the first gigs that was my own show. Nice one. And this is also another one, uh, Papa Krak asking, I want to ask Lee, even though he will miss his question. Instead, no, he, get, he got it. What would he recommend that a first time listener will listen to out all of the material he has recorded? Wow. Um, <laughs> you mean one of my records? Yeah, of course. Wow. Well, oh, you um, need to pick one. <laughs> uh, it, it you know I I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of albums now and and 
there's like 45 albums and uh, so uh, it, it's hard to say you know in the 90s uh, there was uh, records like Westbound that were dedicated to the great jazz guitarist Wes Montgomery that had some of still my more popular tunes on it that were I had written in honor of Wes and so there's that record the, the, the six string theory record where it's not just my record but uh, if you, you love guitar, it's a great guitar player's record because it's not only me, but it's me playing with, uh, with a lot of other great guitar players, not on every track, but uh, with me with Steve Lukather, with uh, uh, Lukather and Slash and I, and, and uh, with uh, John Schofield, and, and so Six String Theory is uh, also a, a really terrific record that has some cool tunes on it. And, and has a sampling of some of the greatest guitar players in the world. So, uh, there, but there's, you know, a lot. And then I do have to say that if you, you know, as far as solo guitar, uh, it was so interesting that I was, uh, I had never done a solo guitar record ever in my life. And you have to understand, I've been playing the guitar and I have been, you know, whether it's Eight. Pink Floyd or, you know, whoever the Streisand or 100 Piece Orchestra or, I've been on some... Aretha some, Franklin. Yeah, Aretha. And I, I've been on a bunch of, you know, big records and and, and also under, you know, a lot of pressure to, to, to deliver. And yet I had never done uh, a solo guitar record. So finally when I cut, committed to it, and, and I had to commit to it here in this temporary room with kind of a new setup, and then most of it, was recorded when the, the pandemic set in. So even my engineer that has worked with me for also for 40 years, Don Murray, couldn't really come over and help, so I would send him tracks to see how it was going. But what I want to say about Dreamcatcher was that uh, not only was it just me and making a Lee Rittenauer solo guitar record and trying to figure out what I was going to do and writing-wise and sound-wise and tone-wise... Well, as I was making it, why I was it was so uh, such a special project for me because it felt like I was doing my first album, and yeah, that that's some, that's something that you can't uh, it, that doesn't happen very often in life, you know. So, and because I've done every kind of record and I've done it in every kind of circumstances, and and, and then all of a sudden I'm working on this record, and and I'm. Even though it's a solo guitar record, I'm producing it like it's a Lee Rittenauer record. That's why I had these seven different guitars on the record, and and uh, that there's another track on the record called "Couldn't Help Yourself," "Couldn't Help Myself," and the title is a funny title because there's like 20 tracks of guitar on that song, and <laughs> I, and I it was supposed to be just solo guitar, and and little by little I sort of started orchestrating, and all of a sudden I'm using the Taylor high string and and the baritone for a melody and. And I think I even put the iridium distortion on the high string lead, doubling it with the Les Paul and with the jazz guitar. So I was just having, I was in guitar heaven, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, listen, Lee, about dream, dream catching. I mean, after what was a difficult period of your of your life, I mean, a, a few years ago with the barn in Malibu of your old studio, then you decided to go, into the studio alone uh, i mean where you are now in the company of just these seven guitars and give us this magnificent album dream catcher you published it with mascot isn't it yes it was mascot yeah okay and, but and, uh, is this yeah. project you had in mind for a long time or it is a moment of i mean isolation you chose to get back in touch with yourself and release the first solo album of your life no, actually, actually, it was really, it was being planned because anyone that's seen me in concert with the band, you know, uh, these last few years, I would uh, sometimes end uh, a song or the be start a song with uh, some solo guitar. Not, and once in a while, there, there would be uh, a... Uh, uh, a whole song that I would play solo, but most of the time it was an improvisation. It was kind of a stream of consciousness. And so then I, everybody was encouraging me to maybe do a, uh, try to do a solo guitar record. And why don't you do a solo guitar record? That'd be great, Lee. And so I, I kept thinking, oh, yeah, 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 I should do that. But then finally, 
towards the end of 19, after I, uh, I also had a health issue that I had never been in a hospital before in my life, and that happened right after the fire, nothing to do with the fire, but uh, so that combined with the, the fire and, and having to kind of restart everything, finally the, uh, the solo guitar record it became apparent that that's what I should be doing and working on. And then 2020 happened, and it was like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so nice I'm so, time. Yeah, it was it was really an inspirational time to do it, and and uh, and then all of a sudden I I turn around and it's sixty years in Los Angeles that I've been playing the guitar. So everything really uh, just became a, a focus, you know. And and uh, here with the family and and uh, my wife and and, uh, and 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 my son lives down the street and with his wife, and so it it it. it it really everybody was together and it was very important and and meanwhile i was together with the guitar so it was ins- inspirational for the writing it was inspirational from the uh me getting sounds whether it was uh you know like oh wow this uh, this effect is cool and let me see what this and how does this amp sound and uh, and so the and the, the playing the discovery field, you know the playing field was level it was like okay, here you are in a new room with some new equipment, some new guitars, your engineer can't come over. You, you got to compose, you got to play, you got to do what you've been doing your whole life, you know. So, so okay, let's roll, you know. That's lovely. Is there any chance you may play just a bit of Dreamcatcher for us tonight? Well, interesting, you're talking about that song, uh, so Dreamcatcher was... I mean, any song from that album. I, I was just talking about the album. Any ah, song. Ah, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let me, um, let me pull up uh, another guitar here for just a second here. Um, it was interesting. Uh, so now I've got this one tuned down a little bit. This is the Yamaha. So I did all new original tunes on the record, and except for this one, my old tune, Morning Glory, which goes back to the 70s. And um, I used to play a club. It's, it's still here in Los Angeles, and uh, it's on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, they don't have too much... Um, they don't have too much... Uh, jazz or anything like that too much anymore of course none of the clubs are open too much right now but that'll change soon um but uh we used to play this club called the roxy and uh so the roxy was a very cool room it was already famous and and uh john lennon and all these people would hang out at the rainbow next door and and the roxy was there and and uh and in those days it was a very cool room and so so I had written this tune uh, called Morning Glory, and it was very, it's a very guitar tune. It's a very simple. I think about that time when I wrote this tune and and it got a very nice reaction from the audience I remember so that was the first time that I realized that well writing a song and having it identified as your song and could make your style more identifiable and bring in your audience more so that's gets back to that I'm gonna play a little more of the tune but that gets back to why songwriting and and, and having your own style. And of course, singer-songwriters have been doing this for forever, you know, and people, composers for hundreds of years have been, but guitar players, you know, when when you think of your favorite rock bands or your favorite blues bands or jazz or, or pop or metal or whatever the style of music you love, you know, it's usually because there's a couple of tunes that that you love, you know, that was always, Indeed. it always comes, even if it's like these phenomenal guitar players, you know, when, when when Eric Clapton first came out with Cream, you know, it was like those tunes, you know, when Hendrix came out with his songs, you know, it was those, of course, it was this phenomenal singing and 
and phenomenal guitar player and this sound that we'd never heard before. So, you know, it's not a, not every day do you get a Jimi Hendrix, but, um, you know, again, there was a great tunes, you know. So I just remember having this reaction playing at the Roxy, and it was like a reminder, like, oh, yeah, okay. So it was an encouragement to keep writing, you know. And this was a a simple tune. in my room again (laughs) yeah yeah. amazing (laughs) so normally i wouldn't even play that tune on this guitar this would be on electric guitar but i said oh i picked up the 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 classical guitar oh okay the the neck is wider i have to deal with that so so it it, the guitar is always you know brings out a different flavor and and, you know you you end up playing something differently depending on the way you hear it so even when we were doing our setting up for our live stream i said well, the sound is not right, and I wanted to fix the sound, right? And when we were checking it out, and so yeah, I, I remember that. Yeah, always, you know, that's that's and that's why people like whether it's Steve Gadd on drums or Harvey Mason or you know the great old Jeff Beccaro who passed years ago with with Toto and stuff. They were always about the sound on their drums, and and uh, when I recorded with Bonamassa on the six string theory, he brought in this little amp for this blues tune. I, he always had these classic amps, always still still does to this day, of what he would use to get his sound, you know. And all of us, uh, uh, you know, they, our ears and our years of practicing, it takes us towards a certain sound. Who was, you know, the, the best for some of that was Hendrix, of course, you know, and Clapton <laughs> and uh, Jeff Beck. And you look at the way he played guitar, you know. So, uh, And then you talk about jazz guitar players. When I first heard Wes Montgomery, he had that sound. But then there was this young 19-year-old George Benson that I heard, you know, at the time. And George had this uh, incredible guitar sound always, right? And and, uh, on top of that, he could sing, right? So he became... uh, But, you know, George, if you go back to early George Benson records, you know, he was was one badass guitar player, still is. Phenomenal. So uh, yeah, nice. I think I think everybody's tired of hearing me talk now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so at all, really. really I don't think so. But, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you something really yeah. important. I mean, you're a musician, so many influences, and we find it hard to imagine anything you haven't already played. But is there something that has remained a dream for you yet? I mean, is there something that Lee Rittner still has to learn? What do you think? Well, you know, 
I think the most important thing is that um, when I got this far in my career and I got this far of playing the guitar all these years, 60 years of playing the guitar and being in the music business, which is, you know, any anything is tough these days, but the music business to have a career in it and all these years, uh, I know that a, a lot of musicians get kind of beat up either well, of course, financially can be very challenging to to make money in the first place, to 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 sustain it over the years, and 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 then continue to have it, and 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 a lot of musicians get tired and bitter, and and then they also sometimes if they have hit records early on in their career, and the audience always just wants them to keep doing the the hits, uh, then they they sort of just repeat themselves and. And they also get tired of music. And, and so with that long story, what I wanted to say is that uh, one of the things that has been most passionate for me is that I still love the guitar and I still love making music and new music and playing with, uh, of course, all the guys and that I've grown up with ever since I was a teenager. And a lot of them are my age or some are older now. And, and uh, But I love playing with all the younger guys as well. And and I love to encourage uh, younger musicians. So, um, if is if there is there anything that I want to do is is just I want to just keep learning, you know, because keep learning. Uh, it doesn't matter, um, you know. Of, of course, there are uh, uh, amazing musicians to uh, to still collaborate with, and amazing guitar players. And there's always something there's always something else to do, and and to you know to figure out you know the first time i w used to go down to south africa and and different african countries and stuff and i'd hear all these rhythms going on and i didn't understand anything you know and i was like wow how are these people making this music and how are these rhythm guitar players doing this stuff you know and the first time i heard brazilian music the same way you know and and uh and then you, you know you go to different countries and you hear different influences and and i think that's another reason that i had the the six string theory foundation it's a it's a window for me to hear all these, you know, very talented young musicians from all over the world making music, and uh, I, you know, it's just my ears are always open to uh, learning, and I, I think that's important in life for, for any of us, you know, and and uh, maybe this year is also a year that all of us are learning a lot. If you're honest with yourself, you know, not just about music, but about life, you know, what's important in life, you know, and. Here in America, we, we, we've been challenged like, uh, you know, every country has its own challenges for sure. But, uh, you know, the, the U.S. people come to visit the U.S. It's, wow, that is one crazy place, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and it is. But, you know, there's uh, uh, a lot of fantastic uh, stuff that has come out of this place as well, you know. So, and, and it's a very frustrating uh, place too, but... Uh, a lot of fantastic music has come out of here and musicians and 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 the, the fact that you know I've had the opportunity to play the guitar this my whole life uh, you know as long as I keep going I'm, I'm good because I'll I'll keep my ears open and, and keep listening and keep trying new stuff and I'm, I'm kind of the same way that I've always been I don't care if it's a country guitar player or a folk guitar player or a flamenco or metal or it was like, um, you know, I, I heard some metal stuff the other day. And I said, how, how in the world did they do that? You know, so <laughs> it, 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 it's like, you know, I'm, I'm always fascinated to, to learn how other music is done. Yeah, I see you are a very curious guy. I mean, uh, you're always looking for something else. I mean, and the, maybe the, the best the best song you have to write is is yet to come. I mean, uh, you keep you keep the travel, you keep the journey, you keep yeah. the journey going on. Well, I mean, th this was proof, like with the Dreamcatcher album. And it, is it my most commercial album? Is it with a band? Is it you know? No, it's none of that stuff. It's it, it's a very personal album and it's a, a, a guitar album. But at the end of the story, it's very melodic and again, it's about the songs. But it's also about my journey with the guitar and 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 my journey with life. So, uh, uh, and and I think what I liked about it was that it it does tell a story. It tells my story, 
and and it, 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 it's important to me. So so it, the album meant you know because sometimes you do an album and, and you and you hope that it, it you always every musician wants to think oh this is my best album ever you know but it doesn't always necessarily turn out like that you know you may have a period where you know you you do an album and it's ex- very successful and the next three albums are kind of like uh, a little bit of that st- same style you know so the the next several albums may not be um completely different you can't reinvent yourself every day it just doesn't happen you know but uh studying music and keeping yourself open and especially in today's world you know the internet is fantastic for that you know it's like there's great guitar players in italy and spain and germany and uh, you know it's just japan it doesn't matter where you are america south america they're all over the place you know great drummers and bass players and singers and and uh but i I think what's nice about the guitar is that along with the drum and the uh, you know it is the most popular instrument in the in the world you know so uh, you know I like being in the guitar community <laughs> yeah, I agree yeah. I see I'm probably gonna have to wrap it up here pretty soon uh, you know, there's, I have to get on with the other side of life here <laughs> like everybody else <laughs> yeah very nice. Just l- l- one last thing. I guess it's important that you're talking about Young, you know. And lately we have launched this Music of Young project in which we interview young and new talents and put them in contact with them, g- some great professionals here in Italy. And you also started your career as a teenager, maybe even younger, you know, where there was nothing like YouTube and Spotify and social networks, uh, etc. Is there any advice you will give to young musicians not to waste their energies? Ah, uh, well, you know, sometimes I do think, we touched on this a little bit before, is that if I was, uh, you know, a young teenager just eating up music and the guitar, for instance, could be on any instrument, but... Uh, you know, I'm sure I would be uh, out there looking at every YouTube video and, and checking out how, you know, and the visual and the audio thing now are so connected, how people learn. And so for sure, I would be doing that just like everyone else is today. And there's no doubt about it. But what I do notice is that the foundation of music, the studying of music with harmony and scales and 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 learning how to orchestrate and arrange and songwriting and all the depth that goes into because it's it's you know you hear um you know s- some incredible f- famous guitar player does some solo and then all of a sudden like we were talking about some young person can copy that solo but they don't know what went into that wh- why that happens so um i remember when i was 13 years old and I took a couple lessons from Joe Pass that we were talking about and Joe was this kind of a Italian gypsy uh, heritage and and he had these incredible ears and of course he he had learned uh, you know playing bebop jazz guitar and 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 he wasn't that schooled you know he wasn't that studied but he had studied enough that when I went to uh, study with him and, and take a couple lessons he and I went to his house, and and I'm like 13, and he says, oh, okay, so what do you want to learn? I said, well, I want to learn how to play jazz like you, Mr. Pass. And uh, he said, okay. He said, well, okay, so when you have a, a C major 7 chord or a C major 9 here, uh, you can play these scales over this, and when you have a, a D minor 7 and a G13, you can play this, and you can do this alternate scale. And he was talking about scales, scales, scales. And I said, uh, Mr. Pass, uh, it's funny, uh, you, you talk about scales a lot, but I, I don't hear when you're improvising, when you're playing jazz, I, I don't hear you playing any scales in your improvisation. <laughs> and, uh, and he looked at me and he said, nah, that's just the way I explain it. That's not the way I really think about it. And, and so he said, I tell you what, 
I'll play some stuff. If you see something you like, stop me and I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> and so that was my that was my lesson with Joe Pass. And and what that really showed was that he, not that he wasn't a good teacher, but he couldn't explain what he did because what he had learned was a history of jazz guitar from copying Charlie Christian and and all the other guitar, great guitar players and piano players and horn players that came before him. But he also had this incredible ear and and his desire to, you know, and his desire of phrasing and stuff. And, and But also in those days, there was no, you know, computer to play with and there was no machines to, to copy. So he was playing with other players and he was learning with other players. So um, even though we talk about this incredible Internet world that we're all on now, as soon as this year is people can get together again, play with other players and always try to play with somebody that's better than you. So you can watch a video where somebody can play something better than you on the Internet and you can copy that. And that's good, too. But as soon as you play with that player who's better than you and you're sitting in the same room, like if I was sitting in the room with some teenager and maybe he or she is a great player, but that we would play the same song and we would play, uh, interpret the melody and we were playing a melody, let's say, not even improvising, just playing the same melody and they play the melody and then I play the melody and then they play the melody. They would learn so much about maybe the way I would phrase and how I would play the rhythm of that melody and, and how I would, you know, choose different parts of the guitar, you know. So, you know, the guitar here and the guitar here and the guitar here, you know. You know, each one of those E naturals, they all sound different. So, do you, how, which way do you play if, if, if you're playing a melody Do you play it all on one string, or do you, or, or do you play it in octaves? That's what's fantastic about the guitar is that there's so many ways to play the same thing differently every time. So these are the things you have to learn. When I was a kid, my my great teacher Duke Miller, most people were learning chords out of a chord book. Today they learn chords from watching YouTube or something, right? Which is fine, and yes. uh, people would learn t chords out of a chord book. My teacher had me write my, at, at 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, had me write my own chord book. So in other words, he, Duke would say, okay, a triad is composed of three notes, right? A triad. In the case of a C triad, it's C, E, and G, root, third, and fifth, right? So he taught me the basics of harmony. Now I'm 12 years old, he's teaching me this, right? So he said, okay, go home on a bar, you know, on this, on a, on a block bar, uh, write down every C chord you can find on the guitar, and then also write it out on the score. So I went home that week, I tried to find every C chord I could and wrote it out, went back and, and he looked at it, he said, okay, that's very good. And, and he said, what about this one? Well, you missed that one, you know. And so we would examine what I missed and what I got right. And then he said, okay, now do it in first inversion with everything in the first inversion and second, in the second version. And now do it in every key. And so then do, and then he taught me about the minor. So do everything in minor in every key and write it down. And then do everything, let's add a sixth. And, and, and then let's add a seventh. So the major seventh, dominant seventh, and then let's do uh, flat five, sharp nine, or sharp, uh, flat five, sharp five, flat nine, sharp nine, eleventh, thirteenth. This book was this big when it was completed, and it took me over a year to do that. Now we did other things in between. We didn't just do that nonstop, but it was like an incredible lesson, and so. All my voicings the way I play chords just even thirds or you know simple 
triads, you know, let alone more sophisticated chords, you know. So when I became a studio musician and I would play with great piano players and and it was like uh, then I I was listening to the piano players and I, and I knew that, you know, maybe some piano player was playing a big 10 10 note chord on the session and maybe it was David Foster and he he was like He's David Foster, so he's playing all this cool stuff, right? And and so if I'm so in order to fit something on the record, maybe I just have to find the perfect little hole of, of what would be the best to complement for the uh, the piano player, you know. So and then growing up with somebody like Dave Grusin, who was the ultimate arranger and orchestrator, you know, he was orchestrating for orchestras and pianos and keyboards and 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 we liked each other because we always stayed out or most of the time stayed out of each other's way. And so, you know, all that stuff doesn't change today, you know, whether you're a singer songwriter and you're or you're in a band trying to figure out uh, how the band's going to play together and the bass player. And now the bass players are phenomenal. You know, it's like now the bass players have more chops than the guitar players, which is fine. That's fine. But now uh, the bass players have to listen with the same equal ears and the guitar players and piano players and the drums, everybody has to listen. So, you know, so I don't know which tangent I got off on, but, you know, it's... It, 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 I can go on forever. So, but yeah. Thanks a lot because I guess this is very crucial to have I mean legends like you saying things like this one to bring back in the right spot what it's important. It's not just you, you can you can be even an outstanding player as you said before, but if you miss the relationship, the interplay, the listening, the practicing and you need to spend time all the um just uh, getting all the words you used tonight. That's right. So I guess this is crucial to have this like a, this testimony tonight and um, have a chance and give a chance to many people, not only the, the people are online with us now, but even in, with people that will check the video in the upcoming days, months, years, to get this, oh, what Lee Rit Ritnor said about this. <laughs> I guess this is an outstanding testimony you're leaving out. Well, yeah, you know, we should probably wrap up pretty soon, but I did want to say one last thing is that um, sure. uh, sometimes I get to do these all-star events, and one year we, uh, in, uh, I guess it was 2015, when uh, Obama was still uh, president of the U.S., we played International Jazz Day at the White House, and um, you know there was phenomenal musicians there, including uh, Aretha Franklin was there, and Al Jarreau, and and uh, it was an incredible band. It was the musical director was John Beasley, but also Pat Metheny was there, and John McLaughlin, and um, Lionel Lewecki was in the band. Of course, Herbie Hancock was heading up the piano. So and Chick Corea was there. It was just uh, and Christian McBride was playing bass, and there was all these phenomenal drummers. And, quite a band you know and that was that's just the beginning of it and there was you know it was like and and it was uh, you know it was quite a quite a night at, at the White House and so there was a couple of days of rehearsals and and people were hanging and stuff and so uh, of course I was featured like everybody else but also you know I've always been a rhythm player and so it was Christian McBride who and and one of the drummers who who's used to working with all these phenomenal young guitar players these days and and a lot of them have super super chops and but i remember christian saying something to me he said he said lee none of these young guys play rhythm anymore so they all want to be they all want to be you guys they all want to be the star and they they don't play rhythm anymore and you know i that's what i grew up That's how I got in the studios. Mm. Mm. You know, being a rhythm guy. And and it, the, the guitar is a rhythm instrument, you know. And you can... And it's not easy to be a great rhythm guitar player. I, You know, I, I grew up coming out here, and, and as I mentioned earlier, Ray Parker Jr. was here, David T. Walker, uh, Wah Wah Watson, 
it was all these great rhythm guitar players and then folk rhythm type pop type guys but all because everybody was working on records and most of the time they were pop records or R&B records and so you weren't the soloist you had to like you, you had to be ready to take that solo on a Steely Dan record or whatever it was but those were the rare things you know I got called to play with Pink Floyd on the wall because I was known as a rhythm guy you know and so that was you know so just you know when you think rhythm is not important for a guitar player to learn think twice about it because it's like it is a rhythm instrument and and it's a great instrument to play rhythm on so for all you young guitar players out there <laughs> you know nice, nice think one. think think about it yeah just last one word i want to thank your sound engineers gary and uh, daniele they've done an outstanding job and i guess everyone tonight heard the sound you you had you, even while talking and playing Ca casual note. <laughs> I mean, the sound it was amazing. It was like staying with you in the same room. Really, thanks uh, <laughs> thank to you. them. Yeah, and it, I want to thank also our uh, our friend Pat from Mascot. He, Absolutely, he worked hard to to organize this meeting, and of course, I want to thank you, Lee, because it it has been an incredible privilege to have you at Music Off guest for us and. I guess this will this will get a long way because you said beside the music, I I, I had no doubt about the music. You know, I've been listening your your tunes for thirty years now, uh -huh. but the the words you have been using tonight and the suggestions, I mean, those will get a long way. I, I I'm sure about that. Really, thanks a lot. Well, thanks a lot. I, I, I love all the, the guys and ladies out there making music and listening and uh, everybody keep listening and making music. I know it's hard times and, and I, I, I do want to thank uh, the mascot label group here at, around the world. They've been uh, great supporters and, and they have a lot of guitar players on the label so I love that. And uh, of course my Yamaha people and, uh, and all my support people uh, and the family. So uh, we'll keep hit playing music and we miss playing live. We'll be there soon. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. All right. Okay, guys, thank you for being here tonight. You will find, of course, this live stream on YouTube, bot and Twitch forever. You will you <laughs> can get it anytime. Oh, no. Every, every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, please, Lee, stay here a second so I will just close the, the live stream. Okay. And, uh, of course, if you have been with us, just place a like on your video and follow on Twitch channel so we will try to find even more occasions like this one even uh, if it's not Lee every night you know but music uh, goes a long way I guess thanks and a lot thank for being thank with us thank you Thomas yeah. for doing what you do thank, thank you very much mate good night good night